advice on that. So he's going to talk about that, and it's also going to touch on it, which I know he's very concerned about, and that's the ethical considerations that go with the revolution in QAI and robotics. So I'll hand over to you now, and you can do your comments. Thank you, Francis. It's a very generous introduction, and uh, one that's better than the one I had in Manchester last year when I was introduced to a panel an expert in artificial insemination. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> right the right on it. Yeah. Um, humor in there but, um, I'm not sure how much left is to speak to, actually. We've seen to have covered quite a lot of ground here, so I'm just going to try to plug a few gaps here. Um, I think we've heard about the enormous opportunity the UK has with regards to the economic upside. Um, we believe that by 2030, the ability to apply AI to our businesses and our processes and uh, augment our workforce could add an additional 10% GDP to the UK economy, so that's £230 billion. Pounds. So we have this enormous economic upside to look forward to. Um, we have the ability to apply this to solve some of the most important problems facing society, how it converges with other emerging tech like drones, for example, to unlock efficiency in cities, um, to apply it to healthcare, to diagnose disease, far better than ever happened before, as Leo was saying there as well. The, the, the use cases are enormous, um, but as we sort of move into this future, there's significant implications, and I think we've touched upon some of the issues around jobs already. Um, as you we were saying, Francis, there's huge um, you know, Fred Osborne estimates here, there's lower OECD estimates, as we said, we think it's maybe up to 30%. But I think the debate around jobs, I'm sure it will come up, it's one that always comes up in the Q&A. Um, sort of looks back on history, on what, if you want to refer to as industrial revolutions, they've always led to displacement and change in employment. Um, historically, they've also led to new types of roles that have led to greater growth and productivity and therefore a greater demand in labour. Um, the other side of the argument suggests, is it different this time? Because in the past we've been replacing um, manual labour, we reached peak force in the previous generations, could we be reaching peak human as it starts to supplant and augment cognitive work and therefore does this start affecting both blue and white collar? We're not sure. I mean, we, we think that if we can get policy right, this is why I spend a lot of time with Stephen and, and colleagues, if we get policy right, if we get education right, if we get the standards right, we can afford to enormous advancements in society. And the economic pull actually drives up labor. There's another layer of jobs we don't yet know exist, and I think my favourite one is, uh, and you'll know, Adam, that uh, machine learning, natural language processing struggles with British sarcasm. We're going to need a workforce of sarcasm trainers, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't be to continue being sarcastic. There's lots of upside there. And we'll touch on jobs, I'm sure you've heard that. Uh, the other side of things, as uh, Adam mentioned as well there, there's been a number of worrying precursors where this has been applied in consumer settings we've heard about these chatbots going rogue, we've heard about bias in recruiting algorithms, we've heard about bots that have been determining the female beauty in the Silicon Valley and it's preferred white skin compared to dark skin. There's a number of issues there um, and a lot of that is around bias in data. As Adam was saying, we all have unconscious bias. Um, there's a lot of work going on, however, to start looking at how do you look to mitigate and eliminate bias. Um, one of the most practical things, though, and unfortunately our panel isn't quite representative of society, and please, obviously, stand here, but uh, uh, diversity in workforce is a real issue here. We have an overwhelmingly homogenous uh, white male workforce in this sector, and uh, this is why, in particular, the government are focusing on access to uh, you know, skills ed education in this field. There's a number of other um, issues, though, I think, as we start applying this technology away from some of the less consequential use cases. For example, movie recommendations, what's the worst that can happen if you have recommended that movie? You can scroll through to find something else. But we're starting to see this now permeate into the very fabric of real consequential use cases, whether it's uh, denying you mortgage or credit, whether it's being applied to criminal justice outcomes on sentencing or if you're let out on bail, through to the biggie around autonomous weapon systems, We've got some really chunky problems ahead of us. And I think if we apply the historical move fast and break things mantra, as we start applying this to important problems, we're opening up a number of chapters of risk that business and society aren't yet equipped to handle. So there's hope for the auditors of the future after all to build trust in this technology. That's what I'm telling you anyway. 
Um, what else can I talk to? Um, I, I think um, from an ethical point of view, uh, you've also seen probably in the press has been this uh, proliferation in patriotic grandstanding by countries across the world. The US clearly have dominance at the moment with VC investment, the startup community, the tech behemoths. Uh, but you see China coming through very fast, significant investment to upskill talent and to lean on research and to push this through to myriad use cases. So um, it's very hard for the UK to set out a school to be the AI leader in the world, but a number of things that have come through in, um, in, in Stephen's uh, colleagues' report here and through the ABC <coughs> is looking at what the UK does do well. It has a respected, barring some recent uh, failings, uh, legal system of legislature. Uh, it's, it has worked for a lot of standards. The British Standards Institute is uh, one of the most prominent areas that contributes to the ISO. Um, but I, I think one thing that's really clear in these reviews is we can set the way in terms of the ethical adoption of this technology. And the government has made some good advice <coughs> to this. And uh, Stephen, I was, I was thinking about when you went to Parliament, one of the, the big mantras of 2010 was the bonfire of the Tango's. Yeah. Remember that? Well, we've opened up a few more, haven't we, since then? We've got the AI Council, the Centre for Creative Ethics and Innovation. We have the uh, Aidan Lovelace Institute. We have uh, the UK Office for AI, uh, artificial intelligence, not termination. Um, so, so, but we, we have, we've got some really interesting institutions coming through that can look at things in the round, look at things way beyond this being just a pure software play, and take into account holistically everything, <coughs> economic growth, solving important problems, education, skilling, and this isn't just about changing our schooling system. I think we're quite confident that kids will adapt. There's a real issue, I think, around mid-career workforce now, around lifelong learning, and this is something that's been uh, captured into the, um, uh, into the uh, industrial review as well, with the, uh, the uh, report tomorrow as well. So uh, what I'm conscious of, because I'm slipping away, I'd love to hear more questions on this. So I'll just leave a quote that I've shamelessly stolen from Lord Clement Jones's report from last week, from the late great Douglas Adams, talking about this hype and mythology and dystopia. Uh, let me just leave you with this quote, and we'll get into some Q&A. <coughs> Point one, everything that's already in the world when you're born is just normal. Point two, anything that gets invented between then and before you turn 35 is incredibly exciting and creative, and with any luck you can make a career out of it. Finally, anything that gets invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. <laughs> the end of civilization as we know it. Until it's been around for about 10 years when it gradually turns out okay, really. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, that's a flat number. I like that. So, in that age, we know where we're at. We say, you know, hey, yeah. Okay, this is time now. We'll be opening it up to any questions and comments. In a way, we've got a really interesting audience here today because we've got people. We're actually in the field of AI and, and robotics. We also have a general audience from OpenNet 21 who aren't necessarily and are more interested about getting greater awareness about it. So having that mixed audience would be good. So let's see if we have any questions uh, <coughs> now. I'll we'll put that to we'll ask the panel for everyone on the panel to answer every question and hopefully we'll get any questions in, but we'll put it up to whether it's the uh, specific person we care about. We have task machines, we have search engines, but what about ethics? How do we control the uh, process of selection? Uh, how do we use the system in ways which we find acceptable as a civilization? Because if we give any other answer, uh, if we're not valid, we're not Okay, well, that's a question for Rob, and also for Stephen in terms of what Simon can do about that. Yeah, let me just get to the, uh, the ethics point here now. The, the, there's a beautiful narrative with AI that I love. I'm a massive sci-fi fan, you know, I grew up in Star Trek and all sorts of things like that. And there's, there's, there's a risk that we leap forward to this kind of future of the singularity where, you know, the whole AI intelligence supersedes the entirety of humanity. And, and we talk about AI ethics quite a lot in the community, <coughs> as though these things are sentient, able to, you know, judge uh, certain human conditions. And, and, and I think, uh, I think Sally would agree as well, is that this isn't about AI ethics, this is about the ethics of AI. And the ethics of AI is set by human beings. This is not sentient technology. Hey, it could be in decades to come, I think some of the experts out there think it might be here as soon as 40 years time. 
but there's a lot we can do right now, whilst this stuff is pretty damn stupid, to put the right checks and balances in place, the right controls, the right standards. And part of that is education. And I, I'll just give you one specific example of what's happening. Um, and, and if you think about the, the, the open source nature of this technology now, you know, anyone here can spin up a, a, an AI product. There is, look through the and then what happens if, and, uh, and looking at the issues around uh, uh, the, the, the opportunity for harm that can come through the, the use of data. So I think there's a lot of work going on, and Stephen, you know, we're putting some of these uh, structures in place, aren't we? So what do you want part of the second standard? Well, uh, it, it's starting with that process. I wouldn't say it's a complete process. Um, the report here, the Lords make some recommendations. Uh, site, the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee is uh, <coughs> an inquiry into the use of algorithms and how they operate. And we will make recommendations, I'm sure, well, that's not for me to say what will be in the report, but um, around <coughs> the right to know, uh, or the right to an explanation of how decisions are arrived at, which, while at the moment they are aspirational, they're not an actual requirement. Um, so I think there is much that we can do, uh, but the ethics, as Rob said, is set by you, the way we, we use these. Um, but of course that still doesn't avoid the issue of bias. And, uh, bias can be embedded in data sets, um, and what we probably need to do is to use AI to find bias within data sets, but we do that by ensuring that those uh, working on the algorithms, the, the AI, are also equally diverse, that we have a wide range of people put inputting so that the output uh, reflects the society that it's supposed to be operating within. Okay, uh, um, let's get to here. I would just like to pick up the point on the Facebook, Google, Apple, etc. society. Many commenters, and I'll quote Elon Musk, and perhaps one of the prominent has expressed significant concerns with the development of AI, specifically these large institutions, which transcend governments and sovereigns, have no control, no oversight of them. And he used the word, he could be not job losses, that's the least of the word, but the terminator effect, that humans, use the word ethics, humans are not perfect, therefore they may create imperfection. So the question is, what is, what is the world doing to control the ethics and uh, how this AI is developed? I think in, uh, in terms of how these companies are viewed and how they're perceived, um, what, what's interesting is you look at the, the nature of these companies, they're, they're often um, very, uh, they're, they're dressed as a very progressive, very liberal type of company, they're often seen as a toddler or even the baby child of American. <coughs> Potentially because of that, they're treated differently. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that the, the problems aren't necessarily that there, there's going to be a terminator effect. I think the problems are, are more discreet than that. I think it's our, our addiction to, to certain technologies, potentially. I think if, you, if you're Facebook, you, you, you have uh, some very, very smart people whose job it is to, to keep you on that street. And they, they know the, the impact of dopamine, and they know the, the psychology around uh, addiction. And, Feedback loops and rewards and all this stuff. And I think actually that that stuff is potentially more harming in the in the short run than this terminator effect, which I I, I think is um, you know, up for debate as to whether that will happen ever. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's those smaller things in terms of our, our day to day lives and our, our addiction to these potential technologies. Um, obviously, the harvesting of data and, and, uh, and using it to manipulate our behaviour in terms of um, our physical. Problem is that there's, there's not necessarily any kind of accountability or responsibility. Um, they're a media company. They make money by by, by monetizing advertising. So they, they make money through advertising, which essentially makes them media. Company. But by positioning themselves as platforms, they often eradicate themselves of the responsibility of the content they serve, um, which yeah, is a problem. Uh, but I think it's more those those um, more discreet problems that that are, are, are more announced. Okay, well, maybe Sally could come back to this, this as well, because um, I think uh, one of you mentioned, I think it was you who mentioned the growth of patriotism around this and, 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 and nation states, United States, China, 
um, trying to take the lead on this, and we talked about big companies that are as big as nation states. Sally, you talked about collaboration. How do we get collaboration in the environment of big companies, national um, competition? I know you've got this global conference, so yes. I'm sure you give us some thoughts about that. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, one thing I wanted to point out as well is in, in terms of there are some interesting things, for example, Effect AI wants things to mind. And then Mitchell and Amazon specifically, they're doing kind of a reverse version of the counter turf that they use. There are some really interesting kind of startup organisations that are working really hard to use AI as a form of centralisation and one blockchain. Uh, and that can really lead to kind of better fair and more transparent payments and the rise of social entrepreneurs and gig economy. I think there's some exciting uses of AI in that environment that will obviously need to take time to challenge some of those big boys you mentioned, but they're doing they're making some great inroads. And also in terms of collaboration, some of these organisations I specifically work with are openly reaching out. So it's much more of an ecosystem approach. And are obviously working with universities and creating partnerships. So there's you know, lots of stuff on this afternoon that we've been doing around your association. So it's all about bringing these different stakeholders together. Um, at the end of this, I'm more than happy to share that today, but I'm specifically involved in it. It's all around this kind of multi stakeholder approach to doing things. And there's an initiative that's UN driven um, along the ticket committee there that's driving this thing forward. And it's all around how we do collaboration far better. Um, there will be an announcement next week about that. But yeah, it's something I'm working on particularly hard. It, it's got to be the way forward. Okay, um, I'm just trying to see if there's a woman up with a hand up for a question. In the back. Oh, yeah. Hi. 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 sentencing laws, or if you're doing a search for executive, so if you're an algorithm that identifies you as a male, and you're looking for a job, you're more likely to see executive jobs. If you're a female, you're more likely to see lower, uh, lower seniority jobs, and so on. So fundamentally, when we're building prediction algorithms, we're almost going to be certainly encoding some existing biases. Um, and this is a big problem in the industry, because they're trying to figure this out. We don't have an answer for that. How often are we to you know, incorporate related with ethics research? I think we're very open to it. And I'd say the, the example we all talk about, I think, in AI, and I'm sure you guys have heard this, is the autonomous cars. Uh, put that car in a position where it's going to be the passenger, where the, the driver who might be killed, or the pedestrian who might be killed. The algorithm determines each one situation we have to kill one of them. Who gets killed? That's sort of the one in the industry that's the one we worry about. <coughs> because not only that, how do we handle you know there are all sorts of insurance things and, and liability? And I think as we just in the industry, we're looking to government and, and society to provide guidance on this. Because you know, we don't have a clue. And I'd be surprised if anyone here has a good answer for that. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. Other than the, the, we need to start a conversation and a more wider conversation that isn't led by our language headlines. So, because in that scenario that you paint, someone dies anyway now. Yeah. And so, while yes, we will then be able to point to an AI or a Thomas Bill and say it made the decision to kill so and so, in a different circumstance, in the real world now, people are going to die on our roads. We mustn't forget that this, that also is the power. And the danger is we say, no, 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 we mustn't have artificial intelligence driving our cars because someone will get killed. 
And so this is a conversation about educating and helping people to understand the world <coughs> in which they are living is changing. And that's about, back to this idea of um, large companies and the, the Terminator effect, is I think we've all now understood that if someone emails you and said, you've won a lottery, or there's a half a billion pounds in a French account that only you can go and access, we treat that with a degree of skepticism. We don't actually think it's real. But however, we do read what we see on our screens, and too many of us are taking it at face value and are being led by that information. So we need to create a more skeptical understanding of it, to understand what the world around them, how, or how the world around them now functions. Okay, Let, let's try to say that if I get the rule out. I put my glasses on this one. But, um, yeah, Juliet. Uh, hi, Juliet Macapilla. My question is um, on um, inclusion. I know you spoke about inclusion, but um, bearing the fact that human beings already do not um, respond very well when it comes to diversity and inclusion issues, my question is how would robots or artificial insemination, which is being inputted by different, culture, by different people, so ethically, I'm struggling to understand cross-culture transition. How would that work? And you've told us here today that there is not many people within. Um, yeah. uh, it's underrepresented. Yeah, this goes way beyond AI. I mean, yeah. This, this is. I mean, I, I've seen firsthand ad tech not designed for society at large. And I've seen soap dispensers that only so dispense soap to white people, for example. You know, this is this AI is kind of you know the long game here. Um, we we don't yet. Uh, technology that's fit for purpose for all parts of society and that has significant societal impact. So we have to, as we start seeing the power of this technology, not just pay lip service to it, but tangibly move this debate forward and, uh, and, and directly speak to this topic and inspire people to uh, come into this field. So I'm absolutely behind you. I'm, I'm seriously concerned about this because if it's not built for everybody, it will affect everybody. And I'll give you one example. It's a data scientist friend of mine, uh, Maxine Mac she, she gives an example um, of how to explain to you know white business leaders like me why it's so important, um, and she uses the female representation. <laughs> so, uh, if you build, um, you know, uh, if you've only got male people building this stuff, uh, data is biased. That leads to bad AI. If you build bad AI that's bad for women, women get affected, women die, women die, we all die. So it's in your interest. <laughs> so, uh, um, but no, it's a deadly serious important factor. Let's not forget that we are in the Houses of Parliament. And no wonder that the question of ethics and values has been already mentioned several times. And unfortunately, I will mention it again. I agree with Simon entirely that initially we may be adapting the values as we go, as the practice. But what kind of practice are they? Is it a North Korean practice? China? Here? We are talking in planetary context. Mm -hmm. We need universal values of humanity. Correct. And not in 50, 70 years' time. We need them almost right now. I disagree strongly with those who say that we have several decades to make that decision. Absolutely not. We have 12, 10 to 12 years. <coughs> Why? Because in 12, 10 to 12 years, we will have imperfect imperfect intelligence, not super intelligence, but perfect in certain areas. And we'll be so smart that we may outsmart us and we'll lose control, as Nick Bostrom says. And that's the need of control which really should be driving us to pass, to have an agreement on human, uh, uh, universal human values so we can pass. Okay, let's pass up this guy for sure. Okay, that's important. It is, yeah, absolutely.
I, mean, so I totally agree with it. And in fact, that we have not solved this problem has stifled the industry of voting. Hmm. It has prevented the industry from getting into certain, you know, making certain decisions. And the ones we're doing that honest driving, they are at the edge right now. And we're already seeing the blowback from that, right? Mm -hmm. totally agree. This is to some extent an issue of standardization. So within the EU, we're, we're a member of a group called Association mm -hmm. of IoT Innovation, part of the European Commission. And within that group, we have a standards commission. And industrial leaders like, like ourselves and other companies, we come in there and we work out with what party the negative behaviors we're trying to avoid. Have we finished that? Absolutely not. In fact, we don't even have a good sense. It's a new organization. We don't have a framework for how to approach that. But AIOTI, for example, is encouraging people from other walks of life, not just engineers and technologists, to get involved and, and, and provide their points of view. Because we're going to have to build standards here. We're going to have to build a way, a framework, a model for how we're going to this, which as technologists we don't have. Okay. I have a good question. What is the end Treatments to 
uh, disease. <coughs> we can't find treatment at all because of its sheer processing power and looking for those patterns. It potentially has the ability to, in certainly in terms of transport autonomous vehicles, uh, to make better use of the road infrastructure that we already have, that is often very crowded and overused and polluting our air, to use that better rather than just build more, to use what we've already got better. Potentially to create an education system that is specific to each and every individual and pushes them to their full potential without them losing interest or falling behind. Um, it would hopefully, in due course, allow us to do more of what we do and with the machines, uh, whether they are physical robots or uh, AI or machine learning algorithms, doing the less enjoyable stuff, the more mundane. So I think there is, that's probably where we see the benefits uh, in part. The, uh, the transition from where we are now to a world where uh, these visions have been realized uh, if, the, if, the, if the, during that transition, as we, the, the, the third industrial revolution, revolution or digital industrial revolution uh, in the 70s and 80s, it saw people displaced. And it's, it's how do you deal with that displacement in a way uh, that doesn't I mean, it is pretty demonstrably that the pipeline leaks 
you can get people to take the first triple science, then take science A levels, then get science degree. And at each stage, people are leaking out, even when they've got their science degree, the calls of engineering, uh, sorry, of banking and insurance uh, seem to suck them in quicker than we can get them into industry actually delivering. Uh, so there is no simple solution, but we do have to also, in this uh, a time when we are going to be looking post-Brexit about an immigration system uh, that is designed to work for the UK, about how we attract talent from around the world to come here. Uh, we need talent, and I think this is a great place for people to come and place themselves and, and work. But in a way, that, that talent pipeline will be filled if we can upskill more people at an earlier stage and make sure that they understand that the jobs of the past, and I keep coming back to this, is because I can just mm -hmm. see that hasn't been grasped yet fully by the public. And, and it may be that in five years' time, when suddenly uh, you try and get the cab outside here to get back to the station or back to your office, and there's no driver in it. And that's a perfectly reasonable assumption, where the average speed of traffic in London is 12 miles an hour. The risk is relatively low. You can see that happening. And I think it will be, uh, I already have black cab drivers knocking on my door. Now, they do knock on my door. Because they detest Uber. Because they see that as a disrupting technology to the established way they've done things for a very long time. So the world is, is changing. We need to make sure that everyone understands that the skills that they will need are much greater than the skills they have perhaps managed in the past. There's no use. Hi, uh, Pierre Coombs, Managing Director of Big Wolf Marketing. Um, my question is. Um, do you, can, can we kind of mutually agree on any sectors or verticals perhaps whereby there should be more governance around AI um, and, and sort of technology of, uh, you know, of, of this discussion um, because perhaps there might be advantages to specific kind of, um, you know, perhaps you know, geopolitical or perhaps, you know, um, you know two dominant companies. Um, should there be specific areas, and obviously there's the humanitarian sort of uh, sectors that, you know, such as going into court and, you know, if you're kind of up against AI, you know, is, is that there? Um, so I'm, ju I'm just sort of throwing out there, is there any sort of sectors or, or sort of verticals that um, we, we would all perhaps, I mean, everybody obviously you know, is coming to the understanding that AI is great um, and, and sort of can see how, it's, how it works and its functionalities in, in sort of society. But is there um, any sort of, you know, sectors or verticals whereby we can all mutually agree that perhaps there should be really strong governance around the use of it? Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, I think there's different measures here. I mean, there's, there's a harm minimization. You know, if you get sold something enough, it's not as bad as an autonomous weapon system going off. Yeah. So, I mean, there's that scale on the axis. But then you look at the other side. Which one gives us the greatest uh, societal benefits to allow human flourishing? Healthcare is absolutely, I think, one of the top ones because you get productivity boost, innovation boost, you get, uh, you know, improvements to well being and, and longer life. So, but for me personally, it's healthcare. I don't know anyone else. I would agree. Also, from my point of view, we probably haven't touched on much in this discussion, but it's really relevant. I mean, DNA, for example, most sensitive data that we've got. Um, so I'm involved in a government thing around how we look at blockchain specifically. So I completely agree with you. The number one thing is Uh, firstly, thank you very much. It's a phenomenal discussion. Uh, my name is Richard Becker. I'm the CEO for a company in Cambridge called Geospot. We're a location intelligence platform. So firstly, I think uh, the UK should do more about broadcasting what it's doing. Uh, we need to uh, take on industrialization 4.0 full strength. We're an amazing nation. Uh, I've had four Chinese companies visit my office in the last three months. Uh, I think the challenge that uh, Rob highlighted is the US are leading in autonomous vehicles and uh, machine learning innovation at the moment. China has set its goal out for 2025 to be the world leader in machine learning, AI, data science. But they're looking to be very acquisitive to buy that leadership. They're not looking to build it all uh, internally, partly because society doesn't want to necessarily go on that journey in China. They have a very sizable challenge to make sure they can automate a big society. Um, for our government, Innovate UK has invested in Cambridge, Oxford, Birmingham, Milton Keynes, Manchester. Lots of money is flowing from government to build smart cities, to do autonomous vehicles. We're involved in a number of those projects. 
making environments safer for transit to drive around. I think we have a phenomenal moment in time. I'll finish this to a link to Sally. Uh, I have three young children. I panic every day about what job they will be doing in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And being part of the industry, I can't connect to how that transforms their life and where they go. They sit on the side of humanities. I think the humanities through school is missing out as we go on this journey. But yet, I think we will need very high emotional intelligence skills in this new world. And we need to try and help the curriculum develop to, to intercept this, the, the technology uh, journey that we're on. So firstly, I think we should be congratulating ourselves. We are leading in a number of ways, but we do not act as proud as we should do. Uh, this is a great form for us to like. Okay, and if you want to say that, I mean, we're not broadcasting that. Awareness of what we do, but also the fears. The webinar we just asked you know, a survey about digital apps in the future and their health in terms of um, uh, big data and so on. And one of the things that's pessimistic, we're not looking at people, the young people, which is surprising, surprised me. So, how do we deal with it? How do we broadcast what we do? But how do we talk about the problem as well? We have a lot of great stuff here. I say it, we are the British citizen. I lived here the last 11 years. Um, this is a small nation, so we're not going to do everything, right? Um, there's going to be a limited amount we can do here, and I know I can see that when I go out to hire, you know, if I'm hiring somebody in the data science sector, I can't pay them less than 200,000 pounds a year. And these are very junior people, right? So we're not going to be able to surmount that challenge quickly. How we broadcast, we do, I think we do a pretty good job of it, honestly. I would agree with you there, that we do a pretty good job of it. If people do accept that this is a center of engineering <coughs> right? We're not the size of, of, of the United States, but I think we do a great job in, in the space sector, <laughs> Thomas Jotty for that matter, there's a lot of, Thomas Beagle, there's a lot of research going on here, uh, satellite production, energy systems, the ones that are going to touch human beings every day, um, the one that's me is energy, and that's the place where the UK is a leader. So I'm, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, let's see, Sarah, yeah, Hi, um, my name is Laura Pierce. I'm the CEO of a tech startup. We're building an automatic speech recognition model for children. Um, and our first use case is through literacy and um, engaging in their tablets and their, their smart screens to make them to get them reading instead of playing games and watching videos. Um, sort of by virtue of uh, well, a bunch of reasons, but one of the main ones that we're sort of focusing on selling to parents um, and kids is because actually we're having a hard time in the, in the area of ed tech. And I spend a lot of time saying we're not an ed tech company. We have an application in education. Um, and that's kind of, you know, ed tech has sort of become a dirty word a little bit because there are exits and, you know, it's a tough sell. So that's not always accurate. But my question and sort of comment is what we've, learned is that it's very difficult to get into schools even though our model can really improve the way that kids are learning to read in schools and the way that teachers are using their time, their very limited time, to help kids learn how to read in the UK and elsewhere in the world. But our stumbling block is teachers. Um, and it kind of goes to the comment that you made about the quote you were quoting is that after a certain age or a certain experience they don't necessarily see the application or maybe they see it as a threat. So I'm just curious to, to hear your thoughts or what anybody's doing on the panel to help educators be educated on AI and its application in, in the classroom. Because right now it feels like, and by the way, this is a, I'm American, but it's, it's a UK technology, it's out of England, and we're really working hard to, to make it global. And it seems like classrooms are still retrofitting technology to fit the way the classrooms run, instead of letting technology lead the way we can teach kids. So I would just be curious to hear what is being done for educators yeah. and education. Do you, do you want to deal with that family and the staff? I mean, there's a culture of value up between teachers and, and the kids themselves. And a lot of people are actually making kids learn from each other. They have some friends. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But well, what can do after this as well? Because the rule knowledge is kind of Birmingham, so I'm kind of for it. Um, one of the issues they had exactly the same problem as you. Uh, and they're doing something like portfolio learning and how you can demonstrate learning in a group and things like that. 
and they're challenging how you pay for the, the curriculum and how you can measure the learning that's taking place. Exactly the same problem about resistance. And I think you've got to together actually would be a fantastic fit going back to collaborations or I'll hook you up together. But one thing I also point out is that something happened to the date of the diary being September 30th this year. Um, and I've already been working with a number of schools, but also at university level as well. We're bringing together a kind of new courses and also bringing together teachers, um, students, and showcasing different projects as they go It's a special, if you like TEDx, we might look at the difference. Uh, and bringing all these people together and talking about the different issues that we're experiencing, I think it'd be a great thing to be involved in. So that's not being made public yet, so we'll look at the case really to find happening. We don't need to work with addressing those very main issues. So yeah, absolutely. But I mean, but for me, I mean, I'm compassionate about that area, and particularly bringing together great things that happen in community education, and like the clubs that are going on, and actually bringing that more into the curriculum together. So we all have got situations where they have only been taught maybe five, and actually you've got an overtake really in terms of student experience and, and kind of teachers not really thinking really how they've got the skills to do that. Um, and also related to that, uh, I, I do agree with what you said earlier on, which has been incredibly um, resilient and agile for change. But I'm a bit concerned, well, a bit concerned to say that about the arts. Uh, so I'm a governor of a particular school, uh, and, it's, and it's difficult on certain music lessons, for example, you need to pay for them. Um, and for me, Technology is amazing, obviously. It's, it's kind of my bread and butter. But it needs creative confidence as well. It needs the imagination to envision the future and build these fantastic solutions. So, for me, massive fashion area. So, uh, what a lot of I'm doing is I've got companies that work at both different schools and universities and different age groups. But how do we build these great projects that happen in the local community and connecting to the schools as well? So, we're going to do a kind of time to do that. So, so, yeah, loads of stuff happening in that area. So, we'd love to continue that conversation. Sorry, I possibly can't, but yeah. Just interested to hear any particularly bizarre or unexpected applications of machine learning or AI that you've encountered. Who, uh, who can answer that? <laughs> or, or valuable, or just something that you know we might not have heard, or you know, increases you know just our imagination in this area. That's <laughs> I mean, for example, so. Um, Are you going to get the answer? No, 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 no. <laughs> I heard one from a year ago um, of someone using machine learning to categorise fish. 
as they're coming in from the trawlers and distinguishing what species, if they're good, if they're bad, and then sorting them accordingly. You raised an interesting point. It's so tight in the press and the marketing farmers and certain startups um, that um, there are certain use cases get lots of attention. You know, Chatbots particularly get a lot of attention. Um, it's only a part of the overall offering. But actually, the ones that actually it's not boring, but it's the really boring sounding ones that have the greatest value. Um, that's one that uh, Adam was talking about. How do you treat your staff better, give them work fairer, you know, um, remove that travel burden, just massive optimization ones. They sound flattery dull, but they're the ones I think that scale nicely, you know, and I've got cases you know it weird ones. I mean we do some stuff around the, the movement of, of sofas increasing the real life. So um, one of our clients is DFS, who we do vehicle routing for DFS. And they have a problem that when you deliver a sofa, um, the problem is that you might be delivering a two-man sofa to you know, 13 floors, or you might be delivering a coffee table to a bungalow in Kent. And so the time that it actually takes to deliver those products is vastly different. But in their current schedules, their delivery schedules, they have a blanket time of 30 minutes. And obviously, you know, delivering and installing a bed is going to take an hour, delivering a coffee is going to take five minutes. So we, um, we have a, an application mobile. We take in um, telematics data, locational data, product data, transactional data to predict how long it's actually going to take to deliver a sofa, which is a slightly oddball, and then we can feed that back into the, the routing and the optimization around the schedule. So it's a slightly weird one, but one of the things that we kind of explore is um, I had a meeting a couple of days ago with a company that wants to use um, machine learning to uh, if kind of architecture companies have. Um, uh, kind of templates for, for flats for certain developments <coughs> and so we we'll look at those, look at the dimensions of a potential architectural site and then essentially match make the site and the template that is right for that particular site. So on the surface it's kind of boring, it's boring but anything where there's a match making element <coughs> there, 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 there's room for improvement. Is there anyone else? <laughs> well, so the storytelling is a great way of giving the substance of concept. I'll do a quick one here. In fact, this will touch also on the UK. Uh, on UK so you guys might have heard of um, DeepMind, certified mm -hmm. for 400 million a couple of years ago by Google. And anybody heard of Deep Dream? Where they saw that Google was painting the incredible pictures. The AI was painting all these psychedelic looking pictures. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, something like that. Uh, you know what that's for? No. That's actually um, something called the Generative Adversarial Network. What they were trying to do one of the big problems we have with deep learning, and this is going to come up, I'll mention briefly why it's important, is that we actually have the, the algorithms of deep learning specifically are opaque. We can't tell why they make the decision. So actually, Deep Dream was a system that was painting a picture, and then there was a discriminator system which had a big rabbit with a real picture, or it made up a picture. And then as it learned better, it fed back. So all that painting was the attempt of a computer without any information, just a model of the world, to create real pictures. So what looked like psychedelic painting uh, was actually a computer trying to teach itself how to, how to draw the world. This is important specifically with deep learning because we talk about things like the Data Protection Act and uh, General Data Protection Regulation. You've got those eight rights, right? And one of them is the right to understand how the decision making is being done. A key problem we have in the mathematics and data science world is that this hot new method, deep learning, can, is, is fundamentally opaque. So actually this whole field of research, we can't even use it for decision making because it would violate GDPR to do it. So that's, what, that's an interesting application of deep learning. Okay, and we've got time, I think, for one more question. So I'm going to make a lot of people disappointed. Um, <laughs> I was just following up on your discussion on GDPR and transparency. I'm quite interested <coughs> in having quite a discussion on uh, how, as a consumer, I have a choice or can make a choice on whether I buy an accident or whether something outside, for example. I mean, is, is, that, is that something that AI, you know, there needs to be like the AI software undisguised in a way as a consumer because it needs to, needs to correspond to my needs, not just 
economic problem that gets utilitarianism. You know, how do we measure fraud? How do we measure the social utility of something? The scary bit here is, and this is going to be a problem I think almost anybody, the idea that how do you measure the value of your life versus the value of somebody else's life? We predict how long you're going to live and how much money you're going to earn versus some other person. We predict, you know, do you look at your health records to make that prediction in real time? So, uh, actually, I actually have no idea. How but but when AI is driving my decisions, I want a choice. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's that's that, that, that's an example. Because some people might argue that in the age of big data and AI, there will no longer be a consumer. I mean, how do you respond to that? And maybe that uh, short response to 